Thanks, Jess. Yeah, really, really excited to be here and such a, an interesting and important time to be talking to Gordon. Gordon, CEO of Oxford Nanopore, which is um, best known for being the creator of a portable DNA sequencer. And at any, at any time, this would be a really kind of interesting and exciting and important innovation. But right now, in this pandemic, it's especially important, both for the work that people are doing using Gordon's tool to, to look at the DNA of, the, of the, the virus, but also because Gordon is currently working on a project that might see us get to a route for mass testing, which to many people, including me, seems like the, the only real way out of this pandemic. Gordon, thanks so much for joining me. Morning, Roland. Nice to uh, meet you virtually after our actual meeting a couple of weeks ago. Exactly. Yeah, I was I was up in Oxford looking at the the tool that you're going to be using for mass testing. But I, I want to start really with the 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 big vision that I associate your company with. Um, why why don't I have a DNA sequencer on my toothbrush? Well. Not yet, I think is the is the answer. You will have one one day. It's possible, right? Like it's it's a it's a theoretical possibility. More than theoretical. I mean, your mouth is full of lots of really interesting things. I mean, for example, when you have a heart operation, the uh, cardiologist will check to make sure there's no infections in your mouth. I mean, you know, that's an extreme case of why you might want to. Um, investigate and um, uh, catalogue the bugs in your mouth. But, you know, gum health, even general disease management, you can get a lot of information from what's in your mouth. What's the big thing that's, that's holding us back from, from that? What's the biggest obstacle in the way from this, this vision of where we have DNA sensors everywhere, monitoring the DNA on surfaces that's coming off our bodies, um, constantly and, and feeding feeding that back. Um, so, if we just look historically, the first human genome was mapped around the turn of the century, about two thousand and three. It took ten years, cost thirty billion, and that was done in large central infrastructures. And in the last fifteen years, it, it's now possible to map a whole human genome for less than a thousand dollars in a couple of days. But it's all done in large central infrastructures. Um, it's almost, it, the parallels between computing and DNA sequencing are there. It, we're in a mainframe moment. What I mean by that is you would need a multi-million dollar budget and millions of dollars of capital to buy all the infrastructure and equipment and software to, to do population genomics. What we're about is the decentralization and democratization of access to DNA information. So today, DNA sequencing like mainframe computing is the preserve of large institutions with multi-million dollar government or um, uh, private finance. And we've been working for the last 15 years on producing small, cheap, portable, handheld, real-time, field-deployable DNA sequences so that you can access source code in real time at your desk, at your desk, in your home, on your toothbrush. Yeah, because how could that help me personally? I think when most people think of genetic sequencing for themselves, they think of something like 23andMe, which is a really a, a one-off. How could continuous DNA sequencing of of all the DNA that's, that's, that's in my body, help me on a day-to-day -day basis? So I think um, uh, 23andMe it, look at a series of associations that gives you some um, probability, probabilistic scores on what diseases you may or may not be predisposed to. But um, uh, given this pandemic, let's just dive into a brilliant use case example on COVID-19. Um, we decided, we've been open through the, um, the lockdown. There's about 95 people in our headquarter building, R&D scientists helping um, on, on COVID-19. Those people are here daily and we decided to swab common areas 
you know, the, the, the cafeteria, the, the meeting rooms. And we actually found COVID all over the building. So, um, and think, migrate that to non-pandemic. Think about, you know, norovirus or some of these infections that, you know, rampage hospitals. They're coming off of door handles or trolleys or being transferred from patient to nurse to care worker and, and you know, right through. So a very simple use case would be if you could access DNA information in real time, you would continually monitor everything around you. And that's before we even started to talk about what's inside you. So let's let's talk about COVID. Um, your, your machines were used to sequence the the genetic information of the virus in China. When, what was the first time you you heard about the the virus, and what do you think when you um, when you heard about it? So um, the we're always so let's let just to sort of take a step back. So DNA sequencing, if you do it in um, uh, the vernacular of war, because everybody does what we do, or what our um, uh, researchers do who use our platforms. They're actually code breakers of the highest order. They actually uncouple every single letter in the COVID genome. So uh, basic biology, your DNA is GTAC, four base code, and COVID has about 30,000 base pairs. And so those researchers have been mapping how what that genome looks like and it changes quite regularly um this morning uh nick professor nick loman from university of birmingham was on radio 4 talking about a, a network in the uk where they've mapped thousands and thousands of covid genomes it allows you to look at the origination of the disease you can track each subtype to a particular place and um uh, and, you know, it was very interesting. There's a clear pattern emerging that there's a lot of variations. And it came into the UK from a lot of different touch points. Yeah, from um, mainly from Spain, France and Italy. It's very, very interesting because because obviously the focus initially was on coming from China. And and I think that it seems like the stage was was kind of very focused on, on that in particular. But it seems as if, as if indirect spread was was the real issue. And that, and that was all done from using your machines, right, to, to try and kind of map the um, sequence, the, um, the genomes of the virus, and that way you can, you can track it. And, and it strikes me that you could use the same technique to identify local lockdowns and see in really, really, really precise way, effect, you know, kind of had it, had it come from this person or that department, that, that should be possible to, to do, right, to inform so that if you have to shut down a local area you, and you can see in a more precise way where where the virus is spread. Absolutely. And if you, to put that in context, in the big vision of what Oxenanapore is trying to do, right? Our strap line is the analysis of any living thing by anyone, anywhere. What I mean by that is, right, it, it, in, a, in a traditional way, if you want to look at a COVID genome, you would find that sample, whether it's a patient sample or a surface sample, you would then ship it to a central laboratory and then they would put it on a large scale sequencer and a week or so later, you can get something back, right? Now, right at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, we saw what was happening in Wuhan and, and this, is, this is our DNA sequencer, right? And I wanna put in context, this machine packs the power of a half million dollar sequencer that's the size of a large fridge freezer okay so we ship 200 of these to the chinese cdc so and, and you can see what happens right where the infection is in wuhan they can go in and start sequencing straight away they don't have to take the samples to a central lab and then you get this you know period when the analysis is done these, these large machines, they're like jumbo jets. You have to completely fill the jet in order to get um, economies of scale and make it cost efficient to sequence that genome. It's, it is literally like take, getting a jumbo jet to take your kid around to the primary school. So, and, and that's an important point because if you look at COVID, it's 30,000 base pairs. 
um, GTAC. If you look at humans, it's three billion. If you look at crops, it's tens of billions. If you look at bugs like E. coli, it's millions. So there's a range of genomes, um, which are the source code of all living things. And what we've been doing for 15 years is producing devices that address the, the biological question in a form factor from a very small handheld device I just showed you there, which is the MinIron, right through to centralized systems where you might be looking at crops or population genomics and everything in between. So, so I want to talk about testing, but first, just on this point about DNA sequencing, your machines were, were used in West Africa during the Ebola um, epidemic there. Can you, can you tell me kind of what, what people were able to do using them and, and why that was useful and important? So the, 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 there's a couple of things and the mainframe to handheld or desktop analogy again holds true. These systems can be used in real time in a field deployable manner, right? So when the outbreak happened in, um, in Africa, there's this amazing guy who works at the World Health Organization, Miles Carroll, at Port and Dan. Um, you know, he actually took the Ebola vaccine to try and convince people that it wasn't harmful. There was a lot of controversy around that. But, you know, he got in touch with us and, you know, we, we donated the, the Minions. So they were actually being deployed in the field. And um, we're working with an African consortium right now for field deployable testing in in Africa for COVID. And, and the key thing is you, you take the detection system to the source of the infection. And because you're getting the data back in real time, it, it you know, it, it allows you to properly understand how it's spreading, where it's spreading. And because you can look at the genome type, you might be able to look at the trace to the origin of a particular strain. So yeah, tell me a bit more about, about testing then. Um, you're, you're working on doing the, the kind of testing that would enable us to have mass screening. How are you doing this? Yeah, so, so if you, if, let's just do a little bit about DNA sequencing. So the systems we've developed are for reading full genomes, right? And as I've said, COVID is 30,000, a human is 3 billion. And, 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 and this, this thing has, in effect, a battery, if you like, that will allow you to read 30 billion DNA data points before it runs out of steam, okay? So it has a huge capacity to read a lot of DNA data points. And just think about that as information points. When you look at the nucleic acid test, so this is testing for absence or presence of the virus. The gold standard is, is, is actually taking the COVID genome, taking specific regions, photocopying them, and then doing a fluorescence measurement. Now we can take that, and that is how testing is done today. And, and you know the, the targets that the government set for swab testing are all based on that technology. But it reaches an upper limit because there is just only so many instruments and reagents to do that testing. If you take that same proposition and do it on a device that was actually engineered to measure billions of DNA data points, you can immediately take this neat trick of photocopying the COVID genome and you don't photocopy the whole thing, you photocopy three times 100 base pair regions. So you do 300 bases and you read each of those about 100 times, and that gives you a genome. So what we can do is then do hundreds, tens, hundreds, and even thousands of samples on these little small devices. And the way that we are going to overcome this pandemic is to be able to go to the point of infection. You need to put the fires out when they emerge. You can't wait until they're raging, as we kind of did at the start of the pandemic, um, as, as most countries did, not really knowing what to do. And to now keep it at bay 
and to gradually release lockdown. As soon as there is an infection, we need to, you know, stamp it out immediately. And you've got to take the fight to the source of the infection. So, so in practical terms, does this mean that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still going into work, that every time I go into the Sky offices, I could, um, I could do a, do a quick swab test, then I could hand in my, hand in my swab, and one of your machines could get the result to me. And while I was waiting, I think I'd wait about an hour, I could go off and, you know, stand somewhere where I'd be completely away from anyone else. And then, then, then I'd get the result immediately. And every single person that comes into Sky could do that. Because that, that to me, seems like that's what would enable Sky or any other large institution to actually really get back to something approaching normal. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I, I actually got into this because I was trying to figure out how we could get football back on. Um, and, and from that, we started to th think about how we could mass test using our platforms. And um, But you're right, the, the, real, um, the, the real gain here is that we need, and, and the model that you, we look at is exactly as you described, um, where we see this going and in the morning, first thing, you're going to spit into a tube that will allow us to get about two to three mils of saliva. It's been uh, scientifically proven that first thing in the morning, you, if you've got the COVID, it's nice and rich in content. And on your way in, um, you'll just drop your bag with the tube in it, which is sealed, by the way to um it could be in the corner of a lab or it could be in the car park because you know the way you see these portable testing centers and and you'll just go off to your desk and within um every two hours in batches of a hundred um you would get data back and if you are positive you'll be uh, told to go home immediately and isolate and 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 this is where the track and trace really gets value. You need the test, right? And if you can test, and now you can go home, and, you know, I will assume Sky will be a very generous um, provider, and uh, you'll get, you'll take some sample test bags home, and your family will also um, be tested, and, and that, that can go back to the test station. And and you, you get two things. One, you get surety. You know, I was, it's very interesting observing in lockdown people who I would describe at the upper end of fear of missing out have got gone to fear of going out. So we've got to bring that confidence back. And you really add such content to track and trace if you can test and test and test again. And so this is possible then. So... To say, like, look, for example, right, universities are facing uh, a really worrying situation at the moment. If every university got, I don't know, you know, five of your machines, could they be doing continuous testing to allow the students to go back uh, and, and avert what is, you know, honestly, a, a kind of looming financial catastrophe? Yeah, uh, so absolutely. The, 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 what we are working on, is a scalable, fast, really rapid, deployable and affordable test system such that everybody can be tested once a week. Um, if you're tested every five to seven days, you're probably going to catch people who have got it. And because you can track and trace them, if somebody you know got it and, and you can then go back and say, well, these are all the people they've been in touch with, and even though they've tested negative, you could test them more intensively. It, it really is about, you know, as I said, it, it, you know, our first phase in this was to be code breakers, right? Now we need to have these decentralized real-time testing continually to be able to pick it up and, and close it down. It's It's not rocket science that if you can contain a fire before it goes wild you know 
it's it's easy to to control that. Um, so you can you can do that then. So you're you're based in 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 Oxford. I mean, could you offer that to the University of of Oxford in time for term to start back up again in late September? We are actually we are talking to Oxford and um, uh, and a couple of US universities who have absolutely thinking about the way that this could be deployed. Because um, when I saw you a couple of weeks ago, I think you said that you could do, um, you'll be doing a million tests a month. Um, I think that was by the, the start of September. Are you, are you still on track for that? Uh, probably we've been able to bring that forward maybe by a month, right? Um, since I saw you... A million tests a month by the start of August. Yeah, the beginning of August, we, we are scaling up. So, so then, so what does what does that mean? So, um, so, so two million by the start of September, four million by by the start. I mean, I mean, because we're talking now about, you know, possibly every university student in in the country could could be being tested continuously, and they could all go back to university in the normal way. I mean, right? That's that's a possibility. There is a small question as to who's going to pay for that, right? Okay, I wanted to ask about this. How much does it cost? Uh, so, I mean, we, we, we think we can get this in the sort of £20 per test. So it's not, you know, it's not hundreds of pounds. It is. But, I, but, but say, but 10,000 students getting tested once a week, it starts to mount up. I mean, we, I mean this year, this, but, but you're talking millions, I suppose. Yeah, I, I think the, so I think there are a couple of things, right? Um we are building up the supply chain such that we can escalate the way you sort of describe a million, then two, then potentially four, right? A million tests a week, in effect, per month. And, and we are building all of that. The, 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 the phase we're in now, um, and since we met a couple of weeks ago, you know, it's being externally tested and the data looks pretty good. It's um, as good as the gold standard. And, and, and that's always been our goal to take gold standard laboratory testing and put it in, in at the point of infection um, with, with trained testing people. The, how we deploy that, right, um, is going to be interesting and in where we deploy it first. Um, but just to kind of, but say it like, you know, it's obviously, I mean, just to kind of focus on this, right, so, you know, we, we've heard so much about schools and universities. If, is it essentially that if that if we could find enough money, then we could we could get be testing every university student, and and we could turn universities back on them. Definitely, um, universities, factories, offices, schools. Um, you know, one of the interesting things is airports, mm. because you know you can get through two or three hundred. Uh, tests in a couple of hours so, you so, so everyone gets tested before they get on their flight if by the time the flights arrived and someone's been tested positive then sorry everyone has to quarantine or turn back and if you and if you don't then you can go on your journey knowing your your negative yeah or you know right now we're talking about a two-week quarantine so everybody getting off a plane could be tested and they can go home but they could then you know get a, a, a message saying you're positive so you're going to quarantine for 14 days. Um, I mean, to me, this is this is it. This is the answer. This is the way that we we get out of this out of lockdown without having a vaccine. I mean, isn't it? Well, I mean, yeah, there are two routes out of this, right? A, a vaccine or yeah. containment by by test and trace and track, and and just you know, symptom checking is okay. But if you can actually have a real test in real time in a field deployable situation and, and you know, and think beyond that, right? Everybody goes back to school. We have a primary school or we have a care home, right? Where we think there's symptoms. We're looking at a, a you know, a field deployable way of actually having a mobile lab turn up at that care home and, you know, in the space of two or three hours, you can um, test everybody and, and see who's got it and who hasn't. And, and that really allows you to stop the spread. And, and that's kind of, you know, right now, 
testing a lot of people will be the next phase. But as the the um, uh, infection rate goes down, then we'll test some people, um, you know, maybe less frequently. And then ultimately, we will want to keep that surveillance going. And, and really importantly, you know, looking into the crystal ball, we have to think about what's going to happen in, in the fall, because we are going to see uh, people getting colds and flu. So we are not just developing a COVID test. This platform, when it's out there being deployed, will also allow us to do respiratory testing for flu, for um, um, common colds, pneumonia, various other things, because there's going to be this spike of something that's COVID-like that will not be COVID. So, you know, and we think a lot internally about sustainable innovation here, right? So it's an interesting moment for the company in that it's a pivot to an applied market test from, you know, code breaking um, genomes for a whole plethora of uh, interesting reasons in, in terms of medical and environmental and uh, research in genetics. Well, Gordon, well, when I, when I came up to Oxford last time to see you, I was feeling, you know, pretty anxious, basically just how I feel all the time, pretty pretty stressed out because it's so hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. But it seems to me that if this is possible, then, then you know, we then we really could get out of this and get out of lockdown. And so it's incredibly exciting and gives me a lot of confidence to hear that you're making progress. Um, thanks for telling me about it. I think this is this is the end of our, of our chat now. But we've uh, well, we've got we've got a bit of questions from the audience later. But uh, yeah, thanks for telling me about it. It's, it's really great to hear. No, thanks for allowing me to share our story. And even in the last couple of weeks, you know, the data that's coming back looks looks amazing. And we're really excited about trying to get things moving again. It was so fantastic to listen to you both. And I am similarly uplifted by everything that has been shared here. I'm kind of hoping that universities find £20 per student per week to be able to do this mass testing. But let's see. But the, um, but the economic, when you think about the economics of it all, I mean, the, the, the cost is so gigantic of having students away and of having businesses. I mean, I've, so sure, There'll sure. be a way. If there's a problem. will, there's a way. And we're going to have some other fantastic discussions this afternoon, looking particularly at data around coronavirus, how we share it, what's ethical to do, what's ethical to store. So please do join us then. Right now, we're going to go over to a Q&A between Gordon and Roland. So please stay on the line here and then, and then join us later on. And keep safe, everyone. Thank you. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.